Phil Lato, and I'd like to welcome you to this installment of our year-long series, The Presidency 2020. Hopefully, you will enjoy what we hope is going to be a broad-based, multifaceted look at the office of President of the United States. Before we begin our scheduled topic for today, I want to once again catch up with the state of the race, in particular, the state of the race to select the Democratic nominee who will face President Trump when America goes to vote on November the 3rd. And in this area, in the month of April, there was some significant news to report. Joe Biden won the one significant primary that was held in the month of April, and easily defeating Bernie Sanders in the Wisconsin presidential primary, a primary that was held with a large number of absentee ballots cast, given, of course, the requirements of social distancing and the inherent dangers of people gathering in such close proximity to each other. The day following the results of Wisconsin being finalized, Biden's last significant challenger, Senator Bernie Sanders, announced that he was suspending his campaign. What candidates do these days when they announce that they are leaving a race? The day after this, former President Barack Obama, whom of course Joe Biden served as vice president, formally endorsed Biden to be the standard bearer of the Democratic Party in the election in November. And then curiously, only after that, did Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, who had left the race following a poor showing on March the 3rd, Super Tuesday, only in April did Elizabeth Warren formally throw her support in endorsing Joe Biden to be the Democratic candidate. So what lies ahead? What is next? First, of course, is the subject of conventions. As we suggested last month, since we last met, the Democrats have decided that they were going to postpone and reschedule their nominating convention from mid-July to mid-August, the convention still scheduled to be held in Milwaukee. Will this be the conventions that we've seen in the past? Will these be gatherings where thousands and thousands of people in close proximity to each other eat, drink, carouse, hoot and holler in the celebration of the party selecting a presidential nominee, or like we're doing now, like so many individuals around the country, both in business and in personal communication and in education have had to do, will this convention be more of a creation of Zoom technology and various players weighing in through the magic of social media and through the magic of um, uh, remote broadcasting. For whatever it's worth, President Trump and the Republican Party still intend to hold a traditional full-blown nominating convention at the end of August in Charlotte, North Carolina. This convention, of course, subject to the circumstances regarding the coronavirus and the progress in the state of North Carolina towards more fully opening up that state. So the conventions still lie ahead. Secondly, the next burning question might be one considering the fact that if Joe Biden were to win the presidency on November the 3rd, by the time he is inaugurated in January of next year, he will be 78 years old. By a fair number of years, the oldest person 
to ever be inaugurated President of the United States. Given that Biden has already pledged to select a female running mate, it is imperative that whoever he selects is able to persuade the electorate that should something happen to the president, she will be, she will be ready to take up the mantle of president of the United States and perform the very important functions that an American president must do. Among those thought to be in Biden's immediate consideration are one, California Senator Kamala Harris, a presidential um, nominee, a contender in the race um, earlier on, someone who has served statewide as the Attorney General of the state of California, now as the junior senator from that state, Kamala Harris, of course, would offer a demographic a benefit, that's the right word, she is an African American, a demographic sector that will have to turn out in very large numbers if Biden hopes to be elected in November. Similarly, Senator Amy Klobuchar, herself a candidate early on for the Democratic nomination, the senator from Minnesota, is thought to be um, within Biden's shortlist of choices. Klobuchar, of course, comes from Minnesota, one of the very important Midwestern states that many believe is going to determine who ultimately wins in November. Someone who has come to a great amount of attention since the circumstances regarding the coronavirus and COVID-19 has become the center of just about everything we watch and everything we do today, someone who has from time to time been the source of some derisive tweets from the president is the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. Again, someone coming from a very important Midwestern state, Michigan, a state that President Trump won in 2016 by just a few thousand votes. Michigan's 16 electoral votes are thought to be very important to President Trump once again reaching that magic number of electability in the Electoral College 270. We'll certainly have more to talk about specifically regarding the Electoral College in the months to come. Finally, another contender is in fact Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, someone who on the campaign trail demonstrated a great command of the major issues that Democratic primary contenders um, addressed, someone that seemed to have a plan to deal with every important issue of the day. One of the problems, if that's the right word, regarding Elizabeth Warren um, joining the ticket is the fact that she comes from a state, Massachusetts, which has a Republican governor, Charlie Baker. In addition to electing a president in November, we know that control of the Senate is very much in play. Republicans enjoying a majority of 53 seats to 47 seats, Democrats would have to win a net of four seats to win outright control of the Senate. But if Joe Biden were to win the presidency, a 50-50 tie in the Senate would constructively give control in the Senate to the party of the president, the vice president in his only duty spelled out in the Constitution is that of the president of the Senate who must cast votes in the event there is a tie. So under this scenario, if Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren were to be elected president and vice president of the United States in November, she would be forced to resign her seat in the Senate 
prior to becoming vice president and have that seat filled by surely the Republican appointee nominee of the governor of Massachusetts, Charlie Baker, which may have the effect of taking away control of the Senate that the Democrats may have secured on election day. So this is something that we are going to very carefully watch. One of the most important early decisions uh, Vice President Biden will have to make is who he selects as his running mate. One other issue already on the horizon is how people are going to be able to actually vote in November for president. We know, of course, that many states in the last decade or so have expanded the ways in which citizens could cast votes in elections. In a state like my home state of Florida, for instance, citizens are permitted to go to certain precincts and cast their ballots early. They're able to request ballots by mail and are able to then fill out and cast that ballot by mail. And Florida is a state that also permits so-called no excuse absentee voting. You ask for an absentee ballot and one will be sent to you. Many other states are much more restrictive in how citizens can vote. And it's going to be interesting to see between now and November whether or not those states' legislatures will offer additional opportunities as the important uh, date of November the 3rd, Election Day, approaches. Now, as I mentioned earlier, for the last nearly two months, the primary focus of so much of the media's attention, the primary focus, I suspect, of so many of our attentions, this great disruptive requirement of staying home and when we go out wearing masks and engaging in social distancing has become the dominant issue of our times and certainly will be far and away the most important issues for voters to consider as they decide whom they are going to cast their votes for on election day. What is the unemployment rate as election day approaches? How much did the economy actually contract? Where does the stock market stand? How are people's 401ks looking? When asked the rhetorical question, are you better off now than you were four years ago? I suspect that how our country and our economy and our workforce rebounds from the debilitating effects of the coronavirus is going to be the determinative factor in how we cast our votes. But it's not to say that there aren't other important issues that the candidates are going to address and that many voters are going to need to consider. In particular, as always, there are notable foreign policy issues that will draw the attentions of the candidates. And between now and the end of the year, we are from time to time going to examine some of these foreign policy hotspots, which at the present time, we see some interesting actions occurring as we make our metaphorical journey um, around the world. China has added yet another source of suspicion to Americans who have, I think, inherently been always suspicious of the motivations of the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party. This new suspicion, of course, having to do with the origins of and the transparency with which China responded to the early outbreak of the coronavirus. North Korea, in just the last couple of days, has added yet another wrinkle coming out of that historically hermit kingdom with the news that its leader, Kim Jong-un, 
was somehow in grave condition following some type of surgery that he underwent. A country who has seen only three leaders since its founding in 1948, the grandfather, the father, and now the son and grandson, Kim Jong-un, is a country with no apparent order of succession, is a country that the 36-year-old Kim Jong-un arguably is still in the process of consolidating power. So to add just another depressing thought to the current state of domestic and world affairs, what happens if Little Rocket Man, as the president branded him, dies, passes away? Who will have control of the stockpile of nuclear missiles that we know the North Korean government has built and sustained? And of course, Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia is out there probably finding a way or thinking of ways to once again meddle and interfere in the American election of 2020. Today, however, we are going to examine the region of the greater Middle East, um, an area, of course, in which the United States has significant, multifaceted, important national interests. We're going to do so by taking apart the puzzle that is today the modern Middle East by examining at least three of the major players in that region with whom the United States in the formation of foreign policy has had to consider and in some case triangulate various alliances and um, agreements with. We're going to look at the state of Israel, we're going to look at the Islamic Republic of Iran, and then we're going to consider the Sunni Arab states of the Middle East and North Africa as three of the significant players in that very complicated part of the world. Now, a hundred years ago, certainly 120 years ago, at the beginning of the 20th century, most Americans had no idea what this long ago um, forgotten area of the world looked like. Um, most American politicians, of course, would not see any foreign policy significance, any geopolitical significance to this lonely, desolate, desert part of the world. Unless, of course, one was a theologian, archeologist, or ancient historian. They would, of course, known, have known that this was the region in which the world's three great monotheistic Abrahamic religions were founded. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They would have also recognized that this is a region known as the cradle of civilization, a region through which large, powerful rivers, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the Nile, often produced lush um, areas. It was a place where ancient civilizations, the Persians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Israelites, the Assyrians, created large cities, cities that today are among some of the oldest um, around the world, storied places like Jerusalem, Damascus, Baghdad, Aleppo, Alexandria, and the ancient city of Qum, which sits in southern Iran. After the Second World War, maybe during and after the Second World War, the United States would come to recognize a growing interest, both geopolitically and personally, regarding ourselves 
and that part of the world. In the decades following the end of the Second World War, as the United States began to produce less oil domestically, as America's great oil companies and those in Europe began to refer to themselves as multinational corporations, the Middle East became a place where lots and lots of inexpensively drilled and extracted oil could be found. So that through the 60s, into the 70s, and then into the 1980s, as our domestic oil production declined, we would find ourselves becoming more and more reliant on oil coming from the greater Middle East. Secondly, with the founding of the State of Israel, 71 years ago, this month in fact, in May of 1948, a creation accomplished by the actions of the United Nations, the United States would begin a long, evolving, bilateral relationship with Israel, the Jewish state created in the historical homeland of the Israelites. This relationship, of course, would evolve into one in which business associations, religious associations, societal associations, and mutual defense goals were pursued. The Cold War, which of course would be underway really before the Second World War formally came to an end, would not be one in which the battle between East and West was limited to just the continents of Europe and Asia and the Far East. In fact, we would see that Iran, a country that shared a very long border to its north with a Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan, became a place that the United States determined was going to be protected as the United States as a country sought to contain the spread of the Soviet Union and its communist government all around the world. So in Iran, the United States would find a willing ally in Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the man who we remember ultimately as the last Shah of Iran, who was virulently anti-communist and eventually a very good customer to those companies in the United States that manufactured all kinds of weaponry as Iran became a well-armed ally of the United States and the West throughout some of the most dangerous years of the Cold War. Finally, through and by the end of the 1970s, after the disastrous Arab oil embargo of 1973, after the precipitous rise in the price of a barrel of oil, in the price of a gallon of gasoline, the United States recognized we had a strong national defense interest in ensuring that a ready supply of increasing quantities of oil was available to a country that had, it seems, an unquenchable thirst for this black gold. So it was in the late 1970s that Americans would begin to recognize and maybe for the very first time become acquainted with the dominant religion in that region, Islam. Become acquainted with the two significant sects, denominations under the broad name of Islam, Shia Islam and Sunni Islam, and come to understand that along a broad spectrum, from Shiite to Sunni, 
there were emerging on the fringes of this spectrum, on the extreme ends of both the Shiite and Sunni parts of this spectrum, extreme ideologies emerging. Ideologies which, which would soon begin to manifest themselves beginning in the very critical year of 1979. In that year, in Iran, the Shah would fall to a revolution that would eventually bring to power an Iranian government headed by a Muslim Shiite cleric, Ayatollah Rola Khomeini, who would declare in April of 1979 that the previously modernizing secular Iran was now the Islamic Republic of Iran, a country determined to impose Shiite versions of Quranic law upon the Iranian people. On the other hand, 1979 was the year that the Soviet Union invaded the Sunni Muslim nation of Afghanistan, beginning a 10-year quagmire that resulted in the Soviets not ever being able to bring that country under control. Soon after that invasion, there would be calls made by clerics embracing an extreme form of Sunni Quranic dogma that at the time was little understood by observers around the world, but for the very first time, many became acquainted with the call for young Sunni men to make their way to Afghanistan, to become Mujahideen, holy warriors, in what was being described as a jihad, a holy war. When this conflict came to an end, when the Soviet Union left Afghanistan in 1989, this far extreme part of the Sunni spectrum, this dogma of jihadism would become the foundation upon which the most significant terrorist groups around the world should be built. When we look at the phenomenon of international terrorism, we're going to recognize that it is almost entirely a Sunni Muslim phenomenon. These extreme interpretations of Sunni dogma would soon bring into being groups like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Boko Haram, and Al-Shabaab, just to name a few of these groups. So as these cracks began to appear on the firmament of the Islamic population in the greater Middle East, 1979 would also be the year in which the Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin and Egypt's President Anwar Sadat signed a peace treaty based on meetings that had taken place in 1978 at Camp David in Maryland so that the following year in March of 1979, this peace deal between Israel and Egypt would make peace between, again, Israel, this Jewish state in the Middle East, and the most populous Arab country in the world, Egypt. And over the next decades, over the last 40 years, there would be various reactions to the coming of peace to this part of the world. So, as I often like to do in these presentations,
How in the world did we get to this critical year of 1979 when in many respects things began to fall apart in this part of the world on a religious basis, on an ethnic basis, on a tribal basis, on a basis country versus country? And the answer, of course, requires that we go back and build a historical timeline that will make the events that we've just spoken of and the ones we will speak about later a little better understood. Now, the countries that today we consider to make up the modern Arab Middle East are countries that up until 1923 and for almost 600 years prior had been part of a much larger Ottoman Empire. An empire run from the north, from Constantinople, the capital of the Ottoman Empire, today's Istanbul in the state of Turkey. An empire that, like most empires, was run on the basis of a hereditary leader, in the case of the Ottoman Empire, a sultan who served as both the political ruler of those under his realm, under his control, but eventually the sultan would also become the caliph, the leader of the Sunni population living under the control of the Ottoman Empire as well. So at this point, we want to do a um, deviation, an aside, and go back and reacquaint ourselves with, again, this faith, the, the great, broad Islamic faith. Adherents, practitioners of Islam, believe that around the year 610, God revealed to his prophet Muhammad the tenets of Islam somewhere in the vast Arabian desert close to the city of Mecca. Um, in the years following the revelation of, of this faith, Muhammad would lead the buildings of large armies, Arab armies, bolstered and injected by this new faith, that would begin to engage in a great conquest, both east and west. To the west, Arab armies would invade and very quickly Islamize Egypt within the first hundred years or so of Muhammad revealing the faith on the Arabian Peninsula. From there, these armies would move northward across the northern Sahara Desert, cross probably over Gibraltar into Europe, and make incursions deep into Spain, the farthest point westward that these movements would occur. To the east, Arab armies very quickly overran Persia moved onward into Southern Asia, a vast expanse of land where today a number of countries that end with the suffix stan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan sit, overwhelmingly Muslim, were in the path in the 11th century of this moving Arab army. They would reach more deeply into Asia, inhabiting what are today all or parts of the states of Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India. Right after Muhammad's death, 632 AD, there developed the beginnings of a schism a split in the faith that I'm going to attempt to explain 
in, in a more simple, less complicated fashion. The burning question at the time of Muhammad's death was who was going to succeed him as the caliph, as the leader of the faithful. One group believed that the next leader of the faith should come from those individuals who were learned elders, contemporaries of Muhammad. You know, a sort of college of cardinals type of collection. This group would eventually over time evolve into the Sunni sect. Another group believed that the prophet Muhammad should only be succeeded by those who were his blood descendants. And eventually, this group would evolve into today's Shia, Shiite Muslim population. Now, the great spread of Islam throughout the world has created a circumstance where today there are an estimated 1.8 billion Muslims living around the world. Only Christianity, with more than two billion practitioners, is a larger religious denomination. About 50 countries have majority Islamic populations, and it's often been stated that the bulk of this Islamic population resides in a swath extending from Africa to the Pacific, as it's often said, from Morocco on the western edge of Africa, on the Atlantic Ocean, through the Middle East, through North Africa, through Southern Asia, through India and Pakistan, all the way through Indonesia to Mindanao, an island in the Philippines from Morocco to Mindanao is the description frequently used. Now, what is the standing? What are the numbers between these two major subdivisions, if that's the proper word, of Islam, Sunni and Shiites? In raw numbers, it is an overwhelmingly Sunni-dominated world. Numbers frequently mentioned as percentages are the world is 90% Sunni, the Islamic word, world, and perhaps just 10% Shiite. Today, the bulk, the largest numbers of practitioners of Islam live not in North Africa, not in the Middle East, not in Iran, Iran geographically, is not located in the Middle East, although politically, of course, it is one of the major players and one of the most disruptive forces. But through Iran, through Central Asia, and again, um, very deeply into Asia is where we find the largest Islamic populations. The four largest majority um, Muslim countries in the world are Indonesia, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, each with a population of Muslims exceeding 100 million. And in this part of the world, in North Africa proper, the populations there are overwhelmingly in some cases, exclusively Sunni. When we get to the greater Middle East, which includes Iran, is when we begin to see significant populations of Shia Muslims living in countries in that region. When we include Iran, in fact, in the greater Middle East, the breakdown is approximately 50-50, Sunni and Shiite, Given the fact that only two countries of any significant population, Iran with a population of 80 million, Iraq with a population of about 40 million, 
are the only two countries with majority Shiite populations. Add to this significant Shiite minority populations in countries like Lebanon, Syria, Kuwait, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Oman, and we see the numbers that again create about a 50-50 balance, Sunni and Shiite. Now, to get even a little more specific and a little more focused, when we look at that region, when you look at the map and see the greater Middle East, you recognize that the Persian Gulf is this critical waterway where today, I mean not today, but in good times, when the oil is flowing and being shipped, about half the oil that is consumed around the world begins its journey to market, sailing through the Persian Gulf, through the tiny Strait of Hormuz, into the Gulf of Oman, and then eventually to the Indian Ocean, to points both east and west. The United States, for now nearly 40 years, has committed as a matter of our national defense to ensuring that the Persian Gulf is open, that the Strait of Hormuz is unobstructed, because we have a strong interest in keeping the oil being shipped to these various um, venues. And when we look at the countries that sit along the Persian Gulf, when we look at Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Yemen, Oman, we see countries where 75% of the population is Shiite, just 25% Sunni. So this large worldwide minority denomination, the Shiites, I guess according to the real estate maxim, location, 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 is heavily um, populating these important points along the Persian Gulf. With that tangent um, completed, the Ottoman Empire limped into the 20th century. Uh, much of its realm controlled through a loose and decentralized fashion. However, in 1914, as World War I began, the Ottomans joined both the German Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire as one of the sides in the Great War, the war to end all wars. And during the course of this conflict, when the Ottomans were seeking to gain territory to their north in Eastern Europe, to their west in Central Europe, in 1915, the British, through the actions of people like T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, persuaded a leader of the Arab population living in the Ottoman Middle East, a man named Hussein, who was the Sharif, the holy keeper of Mecca, to instigate an Arab uprising an Arab revolution for their independence from their Ottoman occupiers in the course of the First World War. Hussein was able to enlist a number of his sons um, who were generals in this uprising against Ottoman control. We know, of course, that the war ended by armistice in November of 1918 followed by a great meeting in Paris, the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, and in the many treaties that were negotiated, in the many remappings that occurred in both Europe and the Middle East, we would see the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East dismembered. We would see Turkey emerge, 
as the rump from which the empire had been led. And we would see, largely along the self-interested lines of British and French diplomats, five new countries emerge in the former Ottoman Middle East. The warm and friendly countries of Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and Palestine. Countries that either France or Britain agreed to play the role of shepherding in to more stable countries with an eye probably on assisting in extracting lots and lots of oil, which turned out to exist under their soils. To facilitate this, three of Hussein's sons became the first kings of Iraq, Syria, Jordan, and one of them would move and in 1925 become the king of Arabia, which found itself with more stable borders deep down into the Arabian Peninsula and the Arabian Desert. Later, Egypt would win its sovereignty from English control. Kuwait, Yemen, Oman, and others would be created as well. The hope of these optimistic map makers in Europe was to create modern nation states wherein the people living in these newly created countries would put aside religious identifications that they had primarily um, lived by, ethnic identifications, Kurd, Persian, Arab, Turkmen, Assyrian, tribal identifications, and just by the snap of a finger, wake up one morning and identify themselves as Iraqis, Jordanians, Syrians, and so on. It was, of course, not just overly optimistic, it was a delusional expectation. So through the 20s and into the 30s and all the way through the 1940s, these monarchies limped along, citizens recognizing that even though oil in some cases had been found and some wealth was being produced, just like under the Ottomans, these monarchs were self-interested, um, they were corrupt, and the standard of living for average citizens did not appear to be much better. These countries then, and arguably today, have been described as nationless states. You could find the state of Iraq or Syria on a map. It's got borders, it's got a capital. But when you look at the people living within that state, way too few consider themselves first and foremost members of the same nation of people a very um, um, destructive um, failing over this period of time. And by the late 40s and the early 50s, much of this region was in the process of change. Monarchs killed, monarchs abdicating, and soon military-backed secular dictators coming to power, trying to find a way each of them to build, once again, these feelings of nationality among the people living in their borders. Now, the events of 1948, um, what was happening in what would become the state of Israel would play a role in helping Arab neighbors in the region try to find some common bond of nationality. By the turn of the last century, by 1900, there had already taken place three years prior, in 1897, a gathering in Basel, Switzerland, called by a journalist named Theodore Herzl, 
that is recognized to be the founding of the modern Zionist movement. The goal being to create a homeland for the world's Jewish population that by this time in a diaspora has spread to just about every inhabited continent on earth. The goal was to create a Jewish state in the ancient historical land that had been inhabited by the Israelites. Soon, large acquisitions of estates were underway in Palestine. Settlements made available to Jews willing to come from America, Europe, Asia, Russia, and elsewhere um, to live. Following or during, I, su I suppose, the First World War in 1917, Arthur Balfour, the foreign minister of Great Britain, uttered what came to be known as the Balfour Declaration, expressing the opinion of His Majesty George V of supporting the eventual creation of a Jewish state in the Middle East. Of course, that didn't happen in 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference, and of course, by the 1920s and the 1930s, we would see the rise of a anti-Semitic fascist state in Germany. And by the time World War II had come to an end, Adolf Hitler's final solution, an extermination of worldwide Jewry, would result in the massacre of somewhere between one-third and one-fourth of the world's entire Jewish population, decimating populations in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, and Russia as well. In 1948, in one of its first significant actions, the United Nations would mandate Palestine be partitioned in order to create, in part of the partitioned Palestine, a Jewish state. A Jewish state that was announced and that declared its independence on May 14th, 1948, as David Ben-Gurion, who would go to become the first Israeli prime minister, declared the independence of Israel as an independent state. And then, over the next 25 years, Israel would find itself at war four times with various combinations of its Arab neighbor states, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq in 1948, in 1956, in 1967, and finally the Yom Kippur War in 1973. During this time, incidentally, Iran was a disinterested non-combatant. The Shah of Iran, a secular leader, um, didn't see this as a fight that the Iranian people had to become involved in. Now, the country that we call today Iran entered the 20th century as Persia, um, a country that recognized a long history of at one time having one of the world's most modern and most evolved societies and most evolved civilizations having for many hundreds of years been led by an uninterrupted line of hereditary monarchs, the Shahs of Persia. In 1908, British explorers struck oil in a region of southern Persia and soon established along the banks of the Persian Gulf an enormous oil refining and transport facility that was located at a place called Abadan, and the British government soon established what would be known as the Anglo-Persian 
oil company, which today in its many evolutions is BP, British Petroleum. This oil would be very critical in powering the British Navy, powering British tanks and other vehicles during the First World War, although Persia itself was not a participant in that conflict. So the timeline goes on until 1925, when the Prime Minister of Persia, the person responsible for executing the orders of the Persian Shah, a man named Reza Pahlavi, staged a coup, and in 1925, Reza Pahlavi declared himself the first of a new line of Persian Shahs, the Pahlavi line. Over the next years, Reza Pahlavi demonstrated himself to be a reformer, to be a modernizer, someone hoping to bring Western-style modernity to, again, this, this backward, desolate Persian state. Roads were built, television lines established, Western-style theaters built in cities, taking perhaps the lead from his neighbor to the northwest, Kemal Mustafa, Ataturk, the father of the modern Turkey, Reza Pahlavi was determined to build his Persia as a secular state, trying to build a separation, as it was said, between mosque and state. To various um, definitions, very successful in this endeavor. However, by the 1930s, Reza Pahlavi also became an admirer of fascist leaders that had emerged in Europe, and in particular, of the fascist government that was being built by Adolf Hitler in Germany. So much so that in 1935, Reza Pahlavi decreed that from that point forward, Persia would now be known as Iran, a word in Farsi meaning of the Aryans. An attempt by him to let the world know that ethnically Persians were an Indo-European race of people, not Semites like their various neighbors to the east or to the west. However, after World War II began, given Reza Pahlavi's admiration for the Nazis, although Iran never was a participant in the war, there was a sufficient concern that he might actually help provide oil to the German government he so admired that in 1941, Britain and the Soviet Union occupied Iran. They deposed Reza Pahlavi. They didn't take his deposition. They knocked him out of power and installed his 22-year-old son, the Western-educated Mohammed Reza Pahlavi, to take his father's place. Mohammad Reza Pahlavi continued this reformist spirit that his father had earlier demonstrated, and in fact became a reformer to the extent of the late 1940s and early 1950s, creating more powerful democratic institutions in Iran, in particular, a legislature known as the Majlis, where elected representatives would select a leader, a prime minister, who had more and more powers devolved to him, the prime minister, from the theoretically all-powerful Shah of Iran. A beautiful arrangement until, in 1953, the arrival of a prime minister by the name of Mohammed Mossadegh, a charismatic leader, a lawyer, a reformer, and it was feared 
a socialist who amassed so much power to himself, he began the process of nationalizing the now Anglo-Iranian oil company and so threatened the Shah that he fled Iran spending several months in exile in Rome. These actions in 1953 caused the British and American governments to act. Through the CIA and MI6, an operation called Ajax, approved by President Eisenhower, was executed that had the effect of discrediting Mossadegh, who was soon toppled by the very fickle Iranian army, paving the way for the return of the Shah, who through the rest of his reign until 1975 would be a reformer or certainly a democratizer, that point more important, no more. So through the 50s into the early 1960s, Iran would begin to recognize the great bounty that oil production um, would give to filling its treasury, even though up until the early 60s, the bulk of the wealth produced by oil went to the companies that extracted it, rather than the companies, the countries from which the oil was coming. So in 1961, Iran became a lead member in the formation of OPEC. You might have heard that in the last few days mentioned a lot the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And through the 60s and into the 1970s, OPEC would be able to claw back more and more and more of the value from the oil taken from its member countries for the benefit of those countries. And no country would use their oil wealth perhaps more cleverly than would Iran. On the one hand, building a very modern military to defend its borders, and in the mind of the Shah, in order to build a larger, professional, secular middle class, sending Iranian students to colleges and universities all around the world to become doctors and lawyers and engineers and dentists and accountants, professions where schools didn't exist at the time in Iran could only gain um, members by sending students abroad. So the 1960s and especially the 1970s were a time in which Iran sent more of its young people abroad for their education than any other country in the world. What happened? These individuals would make their way to the United States. They'd go to the beach and spend an afternoon watching people go by. They would go to keg parties and drink alcohol and enjoy a greater amount perhaps of frivolity on their college campus. In the 60s and 70s, they would witness Americans loudly gathering to exercise their First Amendment right to peaceably assemble and petitioned the government for redress of grievances to protest. We've seen a lot of those in recent days. And then after their graduation, in overwhelming numbers, return home and recognize that there were not any of these civil liberties available to them in Iran that they had tasted when they spent time abroad. So, by the late 60s, early through the 1970s, the Shah found himself dealing with two different types of opposition to the way in which he ruled. One came from the secular, professional, middle-class urban dwellers clamoring for some type of democratization, some recognition of individual rights and liberties. The other group came from the more rural areas, from the more religious Shiite south of Iran, 
calling instead for Iran to organize itself as a country living under Quranic law. In this case, Shiite Sharia law, believing that a majority Muslim country must live in environments where the Constitution is their Quran and the Quran is their Constitution. In 1963, a fiery young cleric by the name of the Ayatollah Rula Khomeini led protests against the Shah's secular rule. He was arrested, causing in many Iranian cities protests coming from his devout followers. Eventually, the Shah would exile Khomeini, sending him to spend time first in Iraq and then later sending him to live in exile in Paris. By the way, if anyone wants to help contribute to send me to live in exile in Paris, we'll be taking a collection maybe at, at some later date, maybe after the coronavirus has passed. Who wouldn't love to be exiled in, in Paris? He might have been out of sight, but Khomeini was not out of mind. Through the 60s and the 70s, smuggled cassette tapes of his sermons calling for the overthrow of the Shah were played in mosques, particularly in Friday afternoon prayers. So as the 1970s wore along, the Shah became a more cloistered figure, building a feared secret police, the Savak, to deal with both insurrections coming from democratizers and insurrections coming from these religious elements. The end, of course, would come in 1979 when the Shah left the country in January of 1979 and when the dust had settled three months or so later in April, that Ayatollah, Rula Khomeini, declared that Iran was now a Persian state but it was now the Islamic Republic of Iran, a country that had always maintained a strong strain of Persian nationalism, almost unique to that region, now living under a government based upon Quranic law. Now, we need to look at one more part of that region a little more specifically. And that was that broad desert country on the Arabian Peninsula that for a time was known as Arabia. In 1925, one of Imam Hussein's sons, Ali, became the king of Arabia. But eight years later, in 1933, he was overthrown by forces loyal to an Arab warlord by the name of Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud. And it was in 1933 that Ibn Saud declared Arabia to now be Saudi Arabia, the Arabia of the Al Saud tribe. And almost immediately, the unique power sharing agreement that the Al Saud tribe had fostered with a religious element in the parts of Arabia that it controlled found its place in the modern Saudi Arabian state. This arrangement was one where the Al Saud tribal leaders around 1750 formed a mutually beneficial alliance with a cleric named Muhammad al-Wahhab, who believed that the way in which Sunni Islam was practiced at the time was not the way in which it was meant to be practiced. Al-Wahhab believed that the proper practice of the Sunni faith was one in which the Faith was carried out 
as it was at the time of the Prophet Muhammad and in the two generations of caliphs that succeeded him. Wahhab was advocating for a more originalist, a more puritanical, and ultimately a more intolerant and violent form of the practice of their faith. And in exchange for al-Wahhab being able to enforce these religious edicts on the population under the control of the al-Sad tribe, the Wahhabi leaders that followed Muhammad al-Wahhab would always support the al-Sad leaders as the legitimate leaders of their tribe. So Ibn Saud establishes the modern Saudi state. And since that time, all the way until the present time, those members of the royal family who succeeded him as the king of Saudi Arabia um, controlled the politics of the state, the flow of oil. It managed the purse of and the treasury of the Saudi state which again was sort of, you know, getting by, eking out an existence in the 50s, even through much of the 1960s. But following the embargo of 1973 and the great rise in the price of oil, through the remainder of the 1970s, the wealth of Saudi Arabia would increase exponentially, month after month after month. So the royal family ran this part of Saudi life, but it gave over to those individuals who succeeded Wahhab, the leaders of Saudi Arabia's religious establishment. Um, the practice sometimes is referred to as Wahhabism, but it is really the Saudi version of a very extreme form of Sunni dogma, originalist and intolerant, known more broadly as Salafism. So in the years following al Saud coming to power, we would see the religious establishment taking control of education and creating the educational curriculum in Saudi Arabia. Because Saudi Arabia was a country living under Sharia law, the courts in Saudi Arabia were, were not occupied by lawyers who'd become jurists, but were run by clerics, again applying Sharia law, Islamic law, in matters ranging from criminal prosecutions to business transactions to the nature of marriages. With the great creation of wealth in the mid-1970s in Saudi Arabia, this relationship grew into one where the Saudi royal family would provide to its religious establishments the funds needed to go outside of Saudi Arabia, certainly in Sunni countries in the Middle East, but also in North Africa, in Asia, in France, in Great Britain, anywhere there was a significant Sunni population and proselytize not proselytizing hate, not proselytizing jihad, but instead encouraging young Sunnis to practice their faith the way it was meant to be practiced, to take a journey over to this more Wahhabist, Salafist form of practice. And when they did so, they found certainly in the Arab Middle East a large audience listening to what these Wahhabi preachers were selling because by this time, by the late 1970s, all of the Arab leaders, these nationalist and nationalistic Arab leaders, most notably people like Gamal Nasser and then Sadat and then Hosni Mubarak, like Hafez Assad, whose son Bashar Assad, now as the leader of Syria. Um, like the predecessors to Saddam Hussein, and then Saddam Hussein himself, 
all of these secular leaders, all of these military men believed that they could build a new nationalism in their countries by promising their citizenry of the rising of another great collection of Arab armies that with the creation of Israel in 1948 were going to collectively remove this new country from their soil. And conflict after conflict, 48, 56, 67, 73, led only to defeat, but also led to loss of territory, loss of pride, a humiliation of these more populous countries being defeated by this newer, smaller state of Israel. And the gradual delegitimizing of these charismatic leaders who just a decade or so before had believed they could build nationalism um, utilizing the shared Arab ethnicity of the time. As these later leaders found themselves becoming less and less popular, they began to build stronger and stronger secret police forces. And soon again, they were detested, just like the kings that preceded them, just like the Ottomans had been earlier. So these Saudi clerics telling people, if you want to find meaning in your life, don't look at some temporal reason like nationality. You can find meaning by practicing your faith the way it was meant to be practiced. And of course, in 1979, with the Soviet Union invading Afghanistan, there would be a cause, there would be a reason, there would be a demand that if in fact you'd made your way over to this Salafist part of the Sunni spectrum, if you were now an adherent to this strain of Sunni Islam, when the Grand Mufti of Mecca in 1980 declared this war in Afghanistan to be a jihad, a holy war, someone of that devotion took this declaration of a holy war as not a choice, but an obligation to become a holy warrior, a mujahideen. And we would see, of course, this great migration, primarily from the greater Middle East, but from North Africa, Asia, and Europe as well, to the remote, far-flung battlefields in Afghanistan, trying to keep that state free from this infidel Soviet occupation. Again, beginning with this invasion in 1979. Now, in Saudi Arabia, um, Ibn Saud's death in 1953 would begin a process where the next king of Saudi Arabia would come from one of the at least 45 sons that Ibn Saud um, fathered during his lifetime, in total um, fathering more than 80 children. So his death in 1953 would lead to the ascension of his son who became King Saad, who ruled until 1964 when his half-brother, King Faisal, succeeded him. When King Faisal was assassinated by one of his nephews in 1975, his half-brother, King Khalid, followed him. Khalid died in 1982. His brother, Fahd, became the king of Saudi Arabia, would occupy that position for the next 23 years. And upon Fahd's death in 2005, Abdullah, would become the next king of Saudi Arabia. He died in, 19, in 2015, and he was succeeded by his half-brother, 
the current king of Saudi Arabia, King Salman. So the Saudis have had this horizontal passage of power, typically from half-brother to half-brother to half-brother. Most notably, of course, after taking the throne, Salman decreed that one of his sons, not one of his still living, younger, somewhat geriatric brothers, was going to succeed him. His son, the current crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Sultan, Mohammed the son of Sultan, will be the next king of Saudi Arabia. And finally, the throne will be passed to the next generation, those individuals who are the grandsons of the founder of the Saudi state, Ibn Saud. There are, about, there are more than a thousand grandsons that in the future might fill this role. So 1979, the Shah overthrown the Islamic Revolution. 1979, Egypt, Israel, signed this historic peace agreement. In that same year, with the invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union, Saudi Wahhabist clerics began this process of recruiting young men to become holy warriors. And we would see the results of what would occur in Iran, Israel, and the Sunni world very quickly. Vis-a-vis -vis Iran, a country that had been a more passive player in the affairs of the Sunni Arab Middle East in 1980, would invade Iraq, beginning an eight-year-long conflict where more than a million Iranians and Iraqis lost their lives. The result would be, however, Iraqi lines holding, and Iraq would come to be regarded with the largest army of any Arab state as constituting a bulwark, a wall of protection for the oil-rich Gulf states from Iran that was seeking to export its revolution to the Middle East. Since the early 1980s, Iran has been judged by the State Department as the greatest state sponsor of terrorism of any country in the world. In the early 1980s, Iran helped facilitate the creation of Hezbollah. Among other things, Hezbollah is the only significant Shiite terrorist group operating in that region, and in some cases around the world. And in conjunction with part of the Iranian military, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, the IRG, in the early 1980s, Iran began the destabilizing of what had been the most stable country created from the dismembering of the Ottoman Empire, Lebanon. In 1983, as American troops were sent to Lebanon to act as a peacekeeping force, Hezbollah engineered a suicide bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut, where more than 300 people were killed. Iran today maintains the largest standing military in the region, a military comprising more than half a million soldiers and sailors, fairly modern equipment, lots of it coming from Russia and China and North Korea, and of course, containing as a supplement the more than 100,000 strong Iranian Revolutionary Guard, a highly committed army within an army pledged to protect the continuance of Iran's revolutionary government. We know, of course, that lots of protests over time occur within Iran, and we also know that a more than one million person strong civilian 
volunteer force known as the Besiege have been known to come out in plain clothes and attack and beat and try to stop these uprisings. Since the 1980s, Iran has had ambitions to build and maintain a nuclear arsenal. Um, in 2015, after Iran had achieved the ability to build a nuclear bomb device, had all of the instruments available to begin refining and processing uranium into highly enriched uranium, in 2015, Iran made a deal with the so-called P5 plus one countries. The five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, the US, Britain, France, Russia, and China, and Germany. The deal called for a relaxation of economic sanctions on Iran, a greater ease of sending its oil to market, and in some cases, the releasing of funds that had been held in some countries like the United States since the revolution of 1979, funds that at the time were the possession of the Shah's Iranian government in exchange, of course, again, for the relaxation of, of sanctions. In 2018, President Trump withdrew from this Iran agreement, imposed even stronger sanctions on Iran, and it's now thought that Iran is once again building a stockpile of increasingly enriched uranium. We know that domestically, Iran is a country whose economy has been crushed. We know that there are protests, Iran becoming a much less stable country. We know that Iran has been ravaged by the coronavirus and the cases of COVID-19 have skyrocketed. Members of the leading um, clique in Iran have been struck by this virus. And we know that Iran is a country that nonetheless still poses a threat to the region. In the 1980s, Iran took up the mantle of the Palestinians and the liberation or the freedom of Palestinians. Theretofore, the Palestinians' co-religionists, fellow Sunnis, Egypt, Iraq, etc., had been the primary advocate for um, the Palestinians. Since the early 1980s, that role has been filled by Iran, making Iran today perceived as the greatest existential threat to the security of Israel, of any country in the world. We know, of course, that when the Soviet Union left Afghanistan in 1989, there were lots and lots of highly motivated mujahideen, or would-be mujahideen, in Afghanistan, in various cities in Pakistan, or somewhere in the pipeline, making their way there. So it was in 1989 that a Saudi national, Osama bin Laden, greatly assisted, tremendously assisted, by hardened veterans of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, created Al-Qaeda, the base, and propounded an ideology that was very much believed by those jihadists who were followers, that their faith was one that was in a constant state of holy war, under constant assault. Al-Qaeda identified a number of near enemies, all of those secular leaders of majority Muslim countries, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, 
that were mandating civil law and not Quranic law, and, and Al-Qaeda identified far enemies. Most importantly, and particularly, the United States, who they viewed, of course, as enablers of these Saudi oils, of these Arab oil states, and a country that had infected these pious peoples living there with music and technology and fashions and maybe, you know, letting women drive, something that, of course, Al-Qaeda um, did not agree with. So through the 90s, if we were watching more carefully, hindsight is always a beautiful thing. To stand here today and look back and say, oh, there were signs, Al-Qaeda began um, committing um, better coordinated and more violent assaults again, American, against American interests. Simultaneously bombing two American embassies in Africa, bombing an American naval vessel docked at port in Aden in Yemen, and then of course striking the United States directly in the attacks of 9-11. Now, two years later, for reasons that have never been entirely clear, in 2003, the United States invaded Iraq and very rapidly removed from power Saddam Hussein, the strong man who, as a Sunni, had managed to exert control over a country, Iraq, that was majority Shiite, with a healthy third population, a Kurdish population in the north. Living under Saddam's thumb, these Shiite, Sunni, and Kurds peacefully coexisted, but when the thumb was removed, and maybe an unexpected development, Iraq fractured into the highly separated Kurdish, central, and southern Shiite region that exists in that country today. Now, following the Camp David Accords, Israel began um, living in an environment where its immediate neighbors were not viewed as such an imminent threat as they had in the past. Um, in its previous wars, particularly the Six Days War in 1967, after Israel quickly defeated Egypt and Syria and Jordan, it maintained sovereignty and control over parts of these countries, perhaps as buffers to protect it against future invasions. So through the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, actions that the Israelis justify as having been self-protective. You know, maybe in the history of warfare, when one nation is attacked and defeats its attacker, it's expected to take spoils as part of the victory. Much of the rest of the world has come to describe places like the Sinai, part of Egypt, like the Gaza Strip, part of Egypt, like the West Bank, previously part of Jordan, and the Golan Heights, an area uh, between Israel and Syria, to be occupied territories, the term that is used. So control of these areas, settlement of these areas, um, has been, of course, a highly debated point in the region, in the UN, and for the most part, up until the current administration, American presidents have tried to walk a more neutral line between the grievances of Palestinians and the expectations of the Israeli government so that sometime in the future, the United States might act as an honest broker, bringing about a more lasting peace in the region. As President Trump 
came into office, he began to view the area, certainly through a different prism, as did most of his foreign policy advisors, recognizing now that the Arab states of the Middle East, the Saudis, the Egyptians, the United Arab Emirates, and others viewed, just like Israel did, Iran as its foremost adversary, as its greatest threat, Israel now metaphorically on the same side of its former aggressors, of its former attackers, the Trump administration weighed in very heavily on this particular side, the Gulf Arab and Israeli side. Number one, President Trump cut off funding to the Palestinian Authority, who he judged as not being eager enough to engage in negotiations. Secondly, really recognizing a, a fait accompli, a done thing, the president ordered that the American embassy in Israel be moved from Tel Aviv, which I think is sort of the administrative capital of Israel, to Jerusalem, a place that most Israelis will tell you they consider to be the capital of that country. President Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear agreement. Again, to the howls of protest from Iran and from most of those European and China and, and Russia countries that were part of this agreement. He recognized the Israeli um, control of the Golan Heights, a very strategic area separating Israel from Syria to be a legitimate control, something again that is a fait accompli. Israel indeed does control it. And finally, more recently, earlier this year, the president released the deal of the century, the template of a peace agreement between Israel and its Palestinian um, neighbors and residents in some cases that would have formalized what again is a reality, that there are large, vibrant Israeli settlements in the West Bank that in the deal of the century would become a continuing part of the state of Israel. We'll follow the developments in, in the greater Middle East, probably catching up with some of the more recent ones by, by the end of the year. It appears that just in the last couple of days, a provisional emergency Israeli government has been formed to deal with a year-long process of elections where no government was able to be formed. And when we meet again next month, our attention is going to turn to the subject of first ladies, and in particular, the life of Eleanor Roosevelt. In a lecture entitled, Eleanor Roosevelt, Not Your Mother's First Lady. So as always, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you so much for um, continuing to abide by the new code of conduct, touching elbows, social distancing, wearing your mask, and I look forward to the day when we will once again be able to meet and exchange these presentations in person. Thanks, and see you soon.